very pleased to introduce Rafaela Campanella, who's from Bologna, and she's going to talk about representing and explaining and intervening on modeling disorders. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you for the, very much for inviting me. So thank you to uh, Emiliano and to Fabio and the others for this great uh, organization of the conference. So in this uh, contribution, I shall focus on modeling disorders and more specifically on mechanistic models of disorders and their uh, explanatory purpose. I shall here address some issues arising more specifically for um, mechanistic modeling of neuropsychiatric disorders, which are, sorry, which are in many cases still pretty poorly understood, uh, subject to a very high rate of individual variations and tackled from many different disciplinary standpoints. So my talk is going to be articulated into three parts. I shall start. Okay. I shall start from some uh, preliminary recalling of some of the core features of some current views on mechanistic models and on some related views on mechanistic modeling of disorders more specifically. I shall then take as an example, as a sort of case study, some models of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is a neuropsychiatric disorder which is being currently very sort of lively uh, debated. And in the third part, I shall discuss some of the remaining features in the light of some aspects of the philosophical debate on mechanistic models, with the aim of stressing some distance between uh, the latter and scientific uh, practice. So my talk is going to be a sort of, I hope, exercise of philosophy of science into scientific practice. So given the uh, ubiquitous use of mechanistic notions in the biomedical and in the health sciences, an understanding of the scientific endeavor in those fields requires, uh, amongst others, some uh, understanding, some reflection on how mechanistic models are conceived of in those fields. While being much uh, in debt, I believe, to Wesley Salmon's conception of probabilistic mechanism, in the last few decades, uh, so-called new mechanism <laughs> views have been developing with distinctive features. A number of different definitions of mechanisms have been put forward by a number of authors, as I just very briefly uh, recall some of the most famous names, Glennon, Markham, Darwin, Kreger, Bechtel, Richardson, Abramson, uh, Tagli, and others. So as a sort of minimal notion of mechanism, we can here take a mechanism to be an organized set of component parts performing some activities to produce some outcome behavior. So mechanism, is taken to underlie a given behavior and is sense identified according to the description of the behavior under inquiry. Components parts of the mechanism and their activities, their spatial and temporal organization and their interactions, the mutual interactions, are held to bring about a given output behavior. A mechanistic explanation outlines the mechanism responsible for the production of the behavior under investigation by indicating not just its inputs and outputs but by saying something on what occurs in between the former and the latter. So mechanisms are considered as organized systems of interacting parts. Uh, mechanistic models are accounts of mechanisms. So quoting from uh, Glennans, uh, a, mechanical uh, a mechanical model sorry, consists of first a description of the mechanism's behavior, so the behavioral description and then the description of the mechanism that accounts for that behavior, which is the mechanical description, where the former amounts to the explanandum and the latter to the explanus. So a mere description of the behavior without an account of the underlying mechanism has not explanatory import. Whereas the behavioral description is a description of what the mechanism does, the mechanical description is a description of how the mechanism produces it by the arrangement and mutual working of its parts. When searching for mechanisms, uh, uh, what we usually get at are, in Macamer, Darden, and Griffith's terms, uh, mechanism sketches or schemat. So a mechanism schema is an abstract description of a type of mechanism that can be filled in with already known component parts and their activities. A sketch is an abstraction for which bottom-out entities and activity cannot, at least not yet, be supplied or which contains gaps or black boxes uh, in some of its uh, stages. Further concepts to differentiate between different kinds of mechanistic models have been put forward by Kreber and then by Darden and Kreber in a recent 2013 volume. Uh, how possibly mechanical models 
are only loosely constrained conjectures about the mechanism that produces the phenomenon of stake, whereas our actual models uh, describe the real components, activities, and organizational features of the mechanism that are, as a matter of fact, involved in the production of the phenomenon. Basically, the how actually models describe, they show how a mechanism works, not merely how it might work and how plausibly mechanisms lie somewhere in between and are more or less consistent with the non-constituent of features of components, activities, organization, triggering and inhibiting uh, condition of the target system. Some of these conceptual tools in the last, I would say, uh, 10 years, maybe less, eight, uh, seven, eight years, have been held useful to deal with medical issues and more specifically with mental disorders. So for instance, that the mechanist approach should be seen as not the only approach, but as one of the most useful approaches for psychiatry insofar as it can suit in a sort of natural way a multicultural framework has been maintained by Kenneth Kendler, who is an eminent psychiatrist. He uh, believes that mechanistic modeling fits psychiatry insofar as it allows to decompose complicated mechanisms into simple subunits, study enhance them in isolation, and then reassemble constituent parts into sort of functioning forms. This operation can be quite straightforward when we're dealing with additive mechanisms, but it's actually much more complicated in such a field as psychiatry where causal networks, uh, networks investigated present multiple non-linear interactions between what are described as biological, psychological, and social economic processes, and often causal loops as well. Uh, a good example in this respect uh, regards household dependence. So what is really at stake here is that psychiatry does not demand to clarify biological, psychological, or social cultural processes as such, obviously, but some unique process arising from some peculiar intertwining of different kinds of processes which can impact in turn on each other in many different ways. For instance, the action of biological factors can be uh, modified by the uh, environment, as much uh, literature in uh, epigenetic, for instance, these days. Uh, it can be modified by stressful life experiences, let's say maternal separation, for instance, and cultural forces. For instance, the acceptability or not of the given behavior in a co uh, social group. If construed without privileging any single level a priori, a mechanistic account is held to provide sort of middle ground between heart reduction and heart emergence. Insofar as the composition is given by is driven by a reductionist stance, while theoretical rearrangement of constituent parts and their activities into complex forms is unguided by some sort of high-level organization. How to model the interactions of such many and diverse factors in, is in psychiatry an extremely relevant issue, not only for theoretical purposes, not only for some sort of theoretical understanding of the diseases as such, but also for clinical, very practical purposes. So, although mechanistic knowledge is not necessary to enact therapies or to start with some preventive policies in sort of population level, mechanistic knowledge significantly increases the success of interventions. So, amongst others, uh, Dominic Murphy has stressed that in psychiatry, as in other medical fields, we use models to explain exemplars, which are idealized representations of the symptoms of disorders and their course and which take collection of symptoms to unfold over time in analogous ways and take patients to respond similarly to the same treatments, which is something which actually never occurs. We always model the disease and always encounter the diseased, and no diseased is exactly alike the disease. So to explain, we then unravel the pathogenic processes accounting for the phenomenon described in the exemplar. Uh, in doing so, we appeal to mechanistic knowledge concerning what are regarded as the standard forms of behavior of the systems involved. For instance, in the case we shall see, the standard neurological functioning of the brain. And clinical reasoning is then sort of asked to adjust exemplar to real cases. So obviously, clinical practice is strongly <coughs> affected by what are taken to be such standard forms of behaviors of the system involved and by knowledge of what are taken to be the underpinning mechanisms. Sorry for that. Uh, finally, 
mechanistic models have been held to be useful also for another very challenging issue in psychiatry, which is the definition and classification of mental disorders. For instance, uh, recent joint work by Kander, Zucker, and Kriver himself, a 2010 paper, suggests that the mechanistic approach is a tool to identify mental disorders through different social and cultural contexts by focusing on some shared physiological mechanisms. So according to them, disorders are to be defined in terms of mutually <coughs> reinforcing networks of causal mechanisms. Uh, they acknowledge that explanatory structures underlying most psychiatric disorders are mostly quite pretty far from being understood, are likely to be pretty messy, in their words, and they also acknowledge that cultural and social factors significantly shape the disease concepts we use. However, they also believe that the identification of some common mechanisms underlying <coughs> distinct cases is the possible ground for a sort of sounder, more stable taxonomy to get across cultural and social and historical differences. So according to Kander, Zaka and Kreber, what is needed for classificatory purposes is, I'm quoting, a scientific model that accommodates variability in members of the kinds, multiple etiologies, and probabilistic interactions between causes and outcomes. So what are neuropsychiatric disorders, uh, sorry, uh, models actually like? How are neuropsychiatric uh, disorders actually uh, modeled? I'm not going to maintain that the mechanistic approach provides the best account of mental disorders for all purposes. I shall just suggest some reflections on mechanistic models in scientific practice by specifically considering the modeling of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, a disorder which has been the object of increasing uh, attention. So in uh, DSM-5, to start with, ADHD is defined as a persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity impulsivity that interferes with development as symptoms presenting in two or more settings and negatively impacts directly on social, academic or occupational functioning. ADHD cases are not homogeneous, so at least three kinds of presentation so far of the disorder have been identified, a predominantly hyperactive impulsive presentation, a predominantly inattentive presentation and sort of combined presentation. Furthermore, symptoms can change over time and so can the presentation of the uh, disorder. It has been regarded quite interestingly, inter interestingly uh, for a long time, just the childhood psychiatric condition, but it is now recognized to persist, at least in a small proportion of cases, into adolescence and adulthood. Symptomatic behavior includes a number of features, uh, for instance, failure to pay close attention to details, difficulties in organizing tasks and activities, excessive talking, deficits in working memory, regulation of motivation and motor control, difficulties in getting started or in sustaining efforts and tasks, in modulating experience and expressing emotion, in sleep and alertness. Specific gene variants have been associated with ADHD. Etiology is still pretty uncertain. Relationships with the environment pretty opaque and the disorder presents arrays of clinical symptoms which are treated both pharmacologically these days and by means of behavioral therapies. So the effectiveness of separate and joint pharmacological and behavioral treatment are the object of investigation and are quite, I must say, likely debate. A number of different models have been elaborated. I shall here consider four, so I'll try to be quick, grounded on neurophysiology. So two relevant causal models are the executive dysfunction model and the motivational model. They are not the only available models that have been successful, very influential, they are still some of the main models uh, on the table and have been alimenting pretty wide uh, debate. So this is the executive dysfunction model which stresses the role of executive dysfunction due to a deficient inhibitory control which is taken to be due to disturbances in the frontal dorsal striatal circuit and associated mesocortical dopaminergic branches. So figure one provides a simple cognitive deficit model of ADHD, it's the column on the left, and a representation of the associated frontostriatal circuit, column on the right. B 
C and S are meant to represent respectively uh, biology, cognition, and symptoms. The slash C represents cognitive deficits. Uh, N E stands for norepinephrine, D A for dopamine, and D L P F C for dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. <coughs> so, what does basically the model want to represent? Uh, ADHD uh, is taken to result from impairments in the dopamine and norepinephrine systems which play a crucial role for efficient communication within the brain system. So the symptoms of ADHD are here considered to be caused by the dysfunctions of the neurocognitive control systems and more specifically by deficit in inhibitory-based executive processes. There is no consensus definition on what executive function uh, processes are, but they're usually taken to be a sort of broad range of cognitive processes which are responsible of facilitating pursuit of future goals and which are believed to be involved in the distribution of cognitive and energetic resources when we are required to meet changing demands in changing situations. So at the neurobiologic level, there is growing evidence that inhibitory control and other cognitive functions are underpinned by a family of basal ganglia thalamocortical circuits. And data from structural and functional neuroimaging studies support the hypothesis that deficits in inhibitory-based executive functions in ADHD are associated with disturbances in the circuit, and dopamine is a key neuromodulator of the circuit. A different model is the uh, motivational model. This was put forward as an alternative to the other one. Uh, according to this model, ADHD results from impaired signaling of delay rewards rising from disturbances in motivational processes, which involve frontoventral striatal reward circuits and mesolimbic branches terminating in the ventral striatum. So deficits are here identified into reward mechanisms with ADHD being thought of as the outcome of neurobiological impairment in the power and efficiency with which the contingency between present action and future reward is signaled to us. So this view of disorder is supported by data on ADHD children's hypersensitivity to delay, difficulties in waiting for motivationally significant outcomes, and in working effectively for long periods of time. So these are held to be related to alterations in another of the dopamine-modulated thalamocortical basal, basal ganglia circuit. So figure two is a simple motivational model of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it's the column on the left, and as a representation of fronto striatal circuit, that's the column on the right. Dopamine is a key neuromodulator of the reward signaling function in this circuit. Uh, what, are, what is interesting is, I believe, how these models have been extended in the last few years. So data actually suggests that the executive circuit and the reward circuit might each make distinctive contributions to the development of the disorder. Uh, but driven by the idea that theoretical models are sort of needed, which combine motivational and cognitive uh, different elements, uh, so, driven by this idea, research is actually being carried on on the relations between different models and on the inclusion of further elements as playing a crucial causal role in the onset and then um, development of the disorder. So, different models have been advanced to shift from common simple deficits model to multiple neurodevelopmental pathways accounts. So, figure three is a representation of the delay aversion hypothesis, which is meant as an extended motivational account of the disorder. And I'm going to try to uh, make it clear, it illustrates the following. So alteration in neurobiological circuits impair the signaling of delay uh, rewards, which leads to impulsiveness. Impulsiveness leads to failures to effectively engage with delay-rich environments. And this failure to engage has the potential then in turn to elicit a negative punitive response from a parent or from another significant other, for instance, a teacher or somebody around the person, which over time tends to a generalized, tend to lead to a generalized delay 
uh, aversion, and this is all represented in the color on the left. The failure to engage with delay-rich environments also constrains the experience of managing delay, and so reduces the opportunities to develop the organizational skills and strategies which are required to deal with this sort of environment. So delay aversion is expressed in this model both as a compounding of existing impulsiveness and as a further elaboration of behavioral characteristics. Over time, uh, according to this model, various processes can reinforce a pattern of symptomatology and impairment can hence persist. So negative parental or teacher's responses elicited by the child's disorder or uncertain and inconsistent environments in which future uh, rewards were promised but they were not delivered, uh, place the child at risk of developing oppositionally in the long term, in the long run. At the same time, the possibility that the child might accommodate uh, the constraints imposed by her underlying neurobiological predisposition to impulsiveness and to delay uh, aversion should be considered. For instance, some studies have been performed in the last few years on how ADHD children develop comp compensatory strategies to exploit limited processing time more efficiently, and they are also being shown to develop compensatory strategies to overcome deficits in working memory. So the final model I want to show you is the extended cognitive uh, model, and similar considerations apply for uh, this one as well. So figure four, this one, is a developmental pathway model based on the simple cognitive model, so the first one I showed. Negative or palliative responses, according to this model, might be elicited from significant adults, parents or teachers, as the left column of the model, potentially resulting in executive task aversion, which can in turn lead to attempt to escape or avoid settings which require executive efforts and specific skills. So reduced exposure to executive type tasks might limit the opportunities to develop executive skills. That's the right uh, call. At the same time, failure on executive tasks might also reduce the extent to which tasks are intrinsically uh, motivating. And so there's a sort of perpetuating the process according to this model. So apart from the technical uh, details, these extended models uh, are put forward as hypothetical, as you might have guessed by these sort of dotted okay, arrows there, and are included features to be further investigated. What is worth stressing from a sort of uh, point of view on how disorders are modeled is that environmental and personal accommodation factors are added into the picture, and they have been added into the picture quite recently. So it is suggested basically that processes regulating the child's engagement with her environment and her significant developmental experiences, for instance, educational agenda, cultural level, uh, some parenting style, shape the course of her development. So on the one hand, similarity in theory should hold a developmental outcome within the same community if we take seriously um, uh, the environment into account. On the other hand, individual differences in different patients are likely to be due, for instance, to specific parenting styles and personal accommodation strategies. So large portions of current research are driven by the idea that multiple pathway models may emerge as particularly powerful explanatory tools in this area. Current investigations are directed, among others, towards a deeper understanding of how brain development on persons with ADHD differs from that in non-affected people of the same age, um, on which role emotions and motivation play in ADHD, on which treatments tend to be more helpful and at the same time safer, and on what, on why and to what extent overlapping can exist between ADHD and other disorders. So in the light of some evidence that executive function deficits and delay aversion pathways are dissociated, but at the same time equally strongly associated with the combined ADHD symptomatology, some sort of integration of the different models is sought 
by place, placing the pathways within a common neurobiological framework and also in the context of some understanding of the interplay between cortical and subcortical brain regions in the regulation of action, cognition, and emotion uh, and motivation. At the same time, we cannot, we can think, never forget that modeling disorders has very kind of practical uh, imports. So neuropathologic heterogeneity in ADHD has very relevant implications for the clinical management of the disorder and more articulated models may in the long run also suggest a better way to tailor treatments into the single cases. So how is ADHD a sort of case study for mental disorder modeled and how is it tentatively explained, which kind of lessons, if any, can we take for philosophy of science and more specifically for kind of philosophical theorizing on what mechanistic models are and uh, how they are built and used. To start with, I believe that the very identification of the explanandum, which clearly always affects the elaboration of the explanatory model, constitutes here a very problematic aspect. So in the case of such controversial disorders as ADHD, but we got others, another very good example I think is post-traumatic stress disorder, we do not start, never, from a single and shared description of a definitely isolated phenomenon. According to Kramer, uh, I'm quoting here, a mechanistic explanation must begin with an accurate and complete characterization of the phenomenon to be explained. And to characterize the phenomenon correctly and completely is the first restrictive step in turning a model into an acceptable mechanistic explanation. In cases like the one I've been uh, showing you, the explanatory enterprise does not start simply from a single accurate and complete description of the system under investigation. So while we struggle to unravel causal mechanisms underpinning the disorder, we shall keep, I think, very well in mind that characterizations of disorders are always subject to shifts, revision, they are affected by social and historical factors, and they change according to ongoing research, discoveries, and innovation. They are extremely sensitive to changes, we can often be quite uh, quick. Furthermore, isolating the explanatum system with precision is very tough in neuropsychiatry, also due to a very high rate of comorbidity in psychiatric disorders. So for instance, ADHD can often co-occur with Tourette syndrome or rage attacks. Tourette syndrome in turn is often accompanied by depression and obsessive compulsive disorder, and many examples could be given in these respects. So the co-occurrence of different disorders <coughs> makes it even sort of more difficult to precisely draw the borders of the pathology to be modeled, so our allegedly target system. Uh, even more difficult to disentangle the relevant variables and their mutual dependence, and detect the precise temporal sequence of, we want, of what we want to model. So the explanandum is always some provisional description of the disorder. What we are modeling and trying to explain in Murphy's terms is an exemplar. So on the one hand, the molecularization of medicine and its mechanistic uh, representations, which have been very fashionable in the last few decades, uh, lead to the elaboration of manageable accounts of clinical conditions, overcoming, so to say, the idiosyncrasies of the individual cases through some sort of regular patterns which are expressed in the models. But on the other hand, single instantiations of the disease, as I was saying, always differ from the model in significant respects. When modeling a disorder, resources should be offered also to account for the range of possible differences that can be then encountered in the clinical practice. The models I showed you, I presented, are quite unspecific and no indication whatsoever is given on the degrees of variability in causal networks involved, which would then account for the range of possible risk of outcome symptoms and even more on their different levels of severity. So in our cases, I'm quoting from Sonuga Barke, a neurophysiologist, models are aimed to account for the cardinal symptom domains of impulsiveness, inattention and hyperactivity. However, a number of other candidate defining features clearly exist. So the elaboration of the model starts from the choice of a minimum set of characterizing features to be explained in a given context. 
The disease here is modeled as a network of impaired normal mechanisms, uh, deficits and malfunctions in specific steps of neurophysiological mechanisms are taken to start with to explain the disorder. That I mean, was the, the, pur uh, the purpose with which the models are put forward. Uh, malfunctions in neurophysiological mechanisms are recognized as sub-mechanisms, constitutive of the disorder. A portion of the recent debate on modeling disorders has been focusing on whether diseases are to be regarded as pathological mechanisms conceived of sort of separate and autonomous entities, for instance, uh, nervi as supporting this view, or rather as malfunctions of physiological mechanisms which should be deemed as conceptually prior over pathological mechanisms. Models considered here, I believe, and I think many others as well, lie somewhere in between. We've got neurophysiological mechanisms which constitute the sort of fundamental components of the disorder and which provide the cues to understand it. But the pathology can be conceptually made sense of as a pathology only as a separate and articulated pathological mechanism, including multiple intertwined and heterogeneous levels. So in particular, in model three and four, the extended models I presented, neurophysiological mechanisms get integrated with non-physiological ones and deficits in the normal neurobiological functioning of the brain system are to be seen without a wider characterization of the disorder as a pathological mechanism on its own, including what they were added as the sort of lateral column of the model. That modeling is meant also for therapeutic interventions, both at physiological and non-physiological level, is a further reason to search for an independent description of the pathological mechanism. A tenet of neomechanism views is the idea that mechanistic modeling requires the specification of the entities, activities, and their organization. Uh, the behavior of the mechanism as a whole is held to depend upon how the components and activities are <coughs> organized and interact with each other, and that's what the mechanistic model, if it wants to be explanatory, must specify. It's called to specify. Quoting again from uh, Glenna, in sort of presenting some criteria to assess mechanical adequacy of the model, he suggests the following. So we should ask, has the model identified all of the components in the mechanism? Have the components been localized? Does the model provide quantitatively accurate descriptions of the interactions and activities of each component? Does the model correctly represent the spatial and temporal organization of the mechanism? Models considered here present, to start with, different degrees of specification and of grains. So the models start off at the neurobiologic level and then proceed to build tentatively causal chains across intermediate cognitive or neuropsychologic and behavioral levels of analysis. <coughs> so they move on to environmental and social levels. So the sort of combination of a very fine grained zoomed in, so to speak, description of the neurophysiologic mechanism underpinning the disorder together with a sort of zoom out at higher levels. The inclusion of higher levels does not simply amount to resituating the mechanistic system into a context, as for instance has been argued recently by Bechtel. But I think it's, here it's an attempt to reshape the very boundaries of the system itself. It's sort of different disease if we take, um, if we take all the rest into account. The resulting mechanism is wider, potentially open to further widening, and with the inclusion of further high-level components, teaching styles, for instance. So implicit in the classic disease model of mental disorders is the assumption that mental disorders are discrete disease entities which result from the function of neuropsychological or biological mechanisms within the patient. And once mental disorders are taken as separate, discrete disease entities, I'm quoting from Sunugabarke again, it's not surprising that much scientific psychopathology seems motivated by a quest to identify the site of the core dysfunction that caused the disorder. 
a widening of the range of potentially relevant causal factors, as that in model three and four, renders the drawing of the target system boundaries and the localization of the causal factors extremely provisional and problematic. The arrows you see in the models are taken to represent the relations between component parts, which are taken, taken as explanatorily relevant in the model. Partly following Kramer, who uh, heavily, I think, relies on Salmon in 1984, a distinction can be drawn between constitutive and etiological causal explanations. So if we want to show how by a phenomenon are uh, certain uh, characteristics, we lay bare its internal causal mechanisms, and this is the constitutive aspect of our explanation, which answers uh, why is this phenomenon occurring this way kind of question. Uh, whereas if we want to understand why a given phenomenon is occurring, we must reveal the causally relevant processes and interactions that have brought about the disorder. And this is the etiological aspect of our explanation and or causal model, answering the how did this phenomenon originate kind of question. So this distinction between etiological and constitutive causal relations I think can be taken to parallel that in medical terms between etiopathogenetic and pathophysiological mechanisms. So the operation of the etiopathogenetic mechanisms determines the development of the initial increased vulnerability to mental disorders. Etiopathogenetic components include patients, for instance, genetic predispositions, which you, you see is not even taken into account in those models. Whereas the activation of the pathophysiological mechanisms, which are the temporally proximal ones, leads to the emergence, the direct emergence of the clinical symptoms. The pathophysiological and or the antipathogenetic parts are explanatory of the clinical. And the clinical, in turn, is called to provide the testing ground of the validity of the former. So models we considered here provide just possible alternative constitutive explanations of the disorder, trying to account for the behavior of the whole system in terms of its pathophysiological mechanisms. The psychopathological mechanisms may be, I'm quoting from Hulis, uh, physical, chemical, biological, psychological, social, or typically mixed ones. So mechanistic explanatory models, if they want to be explanatory, they should clarify relations between different psychopathological sub-mechanisms taken into account. Because the links in our models are visually <coughs> presented differently and what's most relevant, conceived of differently. So while the constitutive causal relations assessed by relying on sort of accepted, was it taken as accepted, mm -hmm. neurophysiological knowledge of the functioning of brain systems are presented as continuous, uh, sort of confirmed causal lines, whereas reinforcing actions performed by higher level causal components are presented as just hypothetical, as adopted causal features in need of further specification. So the working parts here are taken to belong to different granularity levels, and relations between levels are presented as of having a different sort of causal force, at least as far as we know, to be further clarified, as are ideological causes which are not at all included into these models. So indications of what is actually involved are accompanied by hints on how possibly they are organized. The adequacy, I believe, of the model has much to do with both the identification of the genuine causal relations between variables and with what the model is going to be used for. So the issue here is not whether, for instance, impulsivity or aggressiveness involve the brain, by whether a neural or neuropsychologic or social level of analysis is the most useful for understanding why the disorder develops within a certain context. So the field in which the investigation is pursued, whether it is, for instance, genetic psychiatry or immunologic psychiatry or neurophysiology, and the purpose shape the kind of question raised, the methods and the tools employed to answer them, and the sort of 
answers accepted. So in this sense, neurologic and biochemical activities may not be the most adequate level to focus on if the purpose, for instance, is providing uh, some sort of ground for behavioral intervention on ADHD in a school context. As in another case, the physiological level may not be the most adequate to distinguish a panic attack during a near-fatal climbing accident in a perfectly healthy individual and a panic attack in a crowded shopping mall by someone who is affected by uh, agoraphobia. So the way in which mechanisms are investigated shapes the kinds of explanations in which those mechanisms figure. But it is also true, I think, that the use to which the explanation is to be put shapes our search for mechanisms. At the same time, though, once we decide to present a modeling of a multi-level system, then some contribution should be given on how to integrate into a more comprehensive account the networks of interacting systems at different levels, both constituting and bringing about the disorder. So more on the constitute and both on the constitute and ecological side of it. So to try to conclude, uh, if we try to reflect on the dynamics of modeling and scientific practice, I think that at least some of the requirements on, of the new mechanist conception have to be relaxed in contexts like the one state. Um, also, and I think it's a particularly significant one because there has been um, a huge debate going on for a few years now on the adequacy and on the uh, uh, applicability of the new mechanistic account to the biomedical sciences. So such features as an accurate and complete description of the explanandum, the specification of the interactions and organization, can be just seen as sort of a regulatory, regulatory ideal, quite far from the elaboration of actual models of disorders. The latter present an array of interacting subsystems which are known to very various extents, and this very strongly conditions, this very strongly affects the way in which we model disorders. So resulting models, I think, look, as a matter of fact, like some combination of both mechanism sketches and mechanism scheata, if we want to use Michael Merdader and Kravis terms, or like some set of how possibly, how plausibly, and how actually models of sub-mechanisms which are to be combined in the same wider mechanistic models. So models are um, revised and extended, and the modeling is to be understood as a continuous process subject to readjustment. The mechanistic models considered here are admittedly incomplete, admittedly put forward as partly hypothetical, and constructed uh, piecewise. So when dealing with still largely unknown systems, I believe that descriptive and explanatory processes co-evolve and correct each other. So any progress in mechanistic understanding of some level further constrains the space of possible mechanisms underpinning the disorder. And in the process, one obtains a more accurate identification of the mental dysfunction, which in turn enables a more accurate localization of what produces it. The description of the mechanism can reshape the definition and the description of the disease, which can vary and in turn orientate how the modeling um, I was talking with a few neuropsychiatrists in the last uh, few weeks and they were stressing how uh, diagnosis is made on just a purely behavioral basis and explanation these days is sought on a purely neurophysiological basis. So there's a sort of gap on the way in which the model is uh, built and those who were actually supposed to use the model for therapeutic purposes and they're sort of uh, trying to sort of bridge the the gap. Uh, so, when research is carried on on many mental disorders, scientists do not face a real or completely independent object, and knowledge on the relations between different models and between different levels in the target systems are produced simultaneously across different disciplinary fields. So, disciplinary uh, contextualization and unraveling on underpinning assumptions, I think, might help shed some light on relationships between different disciplinary approaches towards the elaboration of some 
sort of more integrate, um, integrated theoretical model. It is with the very purpose, actually, of encouraging some integration between different disciplinary approaches that the neomechanist views of modeling have been advocated in the last few years to integrate progresses from cognitive neuroscience to understand how the activity of neurotransmitters can be linked to cognitive processes, uh, Kraber, Bechtel, and others have been working, uh, Piccinini together with Kraber in this line of research, and eventually to get some basis for psychiatric uh, taxonomy. Models we've considered here um, are put forward as schematic mechanistic representations, and I think might maybe be better considered as models providing some mechanism based than strictly mechanistic explanations. Or it could be put maybe along some continuum of more and less mechanical explanations, working as epistemic tools at the crossroad of known and unknown subsystems and awfully employed to raise new questions. I should just end with two uh, quotations, which are the first is from a neurophysiologist and the other one uh, by a psychiatrist. So a coherent and comprehensive model of the cognitive substrates of ADHD would be a highly desirable means of linking genetic, neurobiologic and phenotypic levels of analysis. But then this target might be quite far, neuropsychiatry as a field being in many respects as a discipline at the how possibly stage. Thank you very much. statistical uh, value of the, the, the mechanic laws that you, we are supposed to, to, to uncover in this long process which is in a very, very highly hypothetical stage, at a very, very highly hypothetical stage so far. So what I mean is this, if I take two engines that are built in the very same manner, I do expect that they work in the very same way. And if I were to apply a statistical uh, analysis, uh, it's only related to mass industrial production and so then to the effects in the fabrication of engines. So then I expect that out of 100 engines, there would be some engines that would not work because of defects in the fabrication, but not because they are not alike in when, 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 I mean, when they were meant to, to work in, in Way. When we come to, the, to psychology, I can see no way in which two individuals have the same psychological history. No way. So no two individuals are really alike because they have different psychological histories, different rights and whatever. So how can ever we hope that, that, that there is a full mechanistic uh, explanation for... Yeah. That's one of the main issues in dealing with this kind of disorder, so there are, I think, many things that can be said in this respect. Uh, to start with, it's really interesting, I mean, I've been trying to read, obviously, as many papers as possible on these things, and the very lexicon they use is kind of uh, different. So sometimes you would find such and such brings about, such and such produces, such and such is the underpinning mechanism of blah, 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 which is a kind of typical, what we regard as mechanistic kind of lexicon, we should which sort of ring us some bells and say, okay, they are thinking about a strong sense of mechanism. But in, sometimes in the very same papers, or in papers by all different authors discussing the very same disorders, you will also find sort of kind of um, weaker uh, lexicon. So such and such is associated with such and such, is supposed to be related with such and such, is 
sort of uh, correlated with or likely give rise like to, to, to be likely, likely to give rise to. Yeah. Okay, so I think to, to start with, the, the same kind of models can be put forward with different emphasis and different force. Uh, first part of the answer. Um, uh, I was not saying here that uh, we should expect such strong explanatory mechanistic models as we are being theorizing them in philosophy of science in the sciences, quite the other way around. I was trying to show that if we want to um, look at how mechanistic models are conceived of in the sciences, then in many respects they are something which is quite far away or at least should be kind of relaxed with respect to the philosophical debate. Um, these models basically, um, okay, mo um, the modeling of ADHD it is being studied from many different uh, respects. So most of the studies actually work on uh, uh, neuroimaging. Mm -hmm. But we, what we observe there is just association. So we see, we see that some neurotransmitter you know, associated to some behavior, and, and we just collect a given amount of statistical evidence. Okay, so obviously the more statistical evidence we collect in this respect, the sort of stronger our causal claim That's is fine. meant to be, as fine with it. But at the same time, it's extremely difficult to add the control group, okay? Because there are so many environmental, personal accommodation features that can be involved. Further, so not only when we've got the group plus the control group, uh, not only we can say that individuals are all sort of alike in all the relevant respects, because we do not know enough about the history of the single individuals. When, when we put somebody in the control group, uh, how? For, for instance, how far um, behind in his personal history do we go to ask for all the relevant information? Okay, so we're not able to do that. Plus, we do not know which are all the relevant features. Okay, so and in many respects, also for other um, mental disorders, um, for instance, we know that some relevant features are relevant, but there's no um, record of that, you know, uh, in that many uh, of us do not have very specific data on the way in which you know, their teacher in primary school were treating them. Who knows? Okay. So that's another uh, big way. The other thing is that, uh, so part is neuroimaging with all the issues arising from neuroimaging and how you set up the experiment and, and so on. Other models are animal models, which are even more difficult for a whole set of for reasons, for instance, animal models like you know, uh, rats and the way in which they behavior in a cylinder full of water have been taken as animal models for depression, to study depression. Okay, because when you put a rat into the water, it's not very happy of, of being there. So it will, it will try to uh, escape. After a while, they all realize they can't escape because the cylinder is high enough. Uh, and so they just stop trying. Okay. Uh, drugs have been tested on those uh, rats to see whether they are efficacious against depression. Taken that the rats which stop first from you know, trying to escape are the sort of clinical depressed ones. Which means that, for instance, our animal model of depression doesn't have anything to do with social factors because the rat is just isolated in the city. Okay, so when, when, we, when we shift from neuroimaging to animal models, I'm not sure that helps much. And in any case, the way in which I choose the animal model, the concrete animal model, in any case, depends on the previous way I've been I'm modeling the disorder. And again, when we work on uh, genetic factors, there are very few studies. They are very unspecific, okay, because apparently uh, different variants can be responsible in some so very low uh, proportion of some disorders. And the only way to do that is through um, studies on uh, homozygotic twins, which obviously, I mean, we don't have, you know, as many homozygotic twins on the perform studies, plus uh, very often they say that we should have very long follow-up to see, you know, the story of the first, and we do not simply have those data. So it's a very kind of flexible uh, enterprise. So no, this is the answer. At the same time, though, there's a recent paper by Maria Kaiser and somebody else in a 2014 volume, which is trying, in order to account for the sort of probabilistic features of some uh, modeling of disorders, they are trying to sort of combine the mechanistic modeling and uh, graphs. 
uh, which I think is a very interesting way to go if we want sort of to make them more quantitative in a way. But at the same time, I don't know whether those would have a sort of developing of modeling into scientific practice. So I think that just interesting from a philosophical point of view. I don't know whether that would sort of make us closer to people elaborating and, and using them. intuition on new mechanisms, but maybe these are simply not mechanisms uh, at all. But at the same time, I think that if we take a sort of minimal sort of idea, of, I mean, I think they are aiming at, at some point, eventually provide us with a complete uh, mechanistic uh, explanation. Okay, so they are actually aiming at uh, putting as much information as possible into the, into the uh, boxes and to giving as much causal meaning as possible to the arrows, which are causal so, arrows. So, so in this respect. Yeah, pro productive. Yeah. It's even more if I understood it's slightly really dealing with a sort of an engine of a machine, a very complex yeah. but a machine where you have pieces something that work together and need something that's a behavioral yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think that's this is not well posed question, but this is okay. Yeah. This but us too, too far. And the, the, I think that another uh, issue here is that basically here, what they're trying to provide is the constitution of the disorder. So basically the disorder is, you know, something in our brain is not uh, working as normally, whatever normally is, um, uh, does. Here, when adding something, I think it's quite interesting that at this point of the research, they're not adding it into the main picture. It sort of put sort of aside. So we are trying to complete in the picture, uh, but is that sort of the disorder itself, or it is something which contributes to the reinforcement of the disorder, but it's not part of the disorder itself. It's another thing, neutral issues, because on sort of answer you uh, you give uh, questions, different uh, treatments are given to people. So. You don't use mechanical in this way, by the way. <laughs> so. Anyway, box and arrow. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so yeah. You're wrong. Yeah. Well, the penultimate slide, you had a distinction between strict, strictly mechanical, so this is in connection with those um, two references to Woodward. Yeah. And I couldn't that quite um, catch so the, uh, the distinction. Sorry. I haven't seen the, uh, I haven't read the papers from Woodward. I'm uh, I, I, interested in. I don't know whether I can. Yeah, the show. Yeah. Slash, yeah, sorry. Okay. Based up. Yeah, and then sorry. Apologies. Um. So, okay. Yeah, I didn't make this explicit. Um. So mechanism based. Yeah. Okay. The the, the the first the first yeah because I think that the I mean. They are providing very, okay, what they claim is that we know enough about the sort of standard way in which our, some areas of our brain work in a sort of standard, uh, let's call it healthy individual, you know, the dopamine circuits work in a certain way, and we know enough about that mechanism, so that's sort of part of my uh, explanation. So I can provide some mechanistic explanation of that bit eventually, but I'm not providing a mechanistic explanation of the whole system once I introduce the other bits of the story, the environment, the personal accommodation, the uh, variation of the, of the system. So, so mechanism based in the sense that the overall explanation of the disorder is based on some knowledge of some sub-mechanisms of what is taken to be the whole disorder. Yeah. So, so is the mechanism based explanation more like just a 
standard causal explanation. No, 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 no. What, what I wanted to say is that they are not providing the same sort of um, grayness in detail in um, accounting for all the boxes and all the arrows. So if we take the um, pathology as a system, so the with all the different levels, all the component levels, it seems that we are trying to explain grounding on some knowledge of some subsystem what's going on in my brain, and then trying to put some other systems, so my myself being in the environment, myself being within a family, myself being at school, myself being I know, exposed to uh, pollution, many theories are working on that, and I have to integrate that system with the allegedly mechanistic knowledge of my of, of the interaction of my brain with the other system if I want to build up a complete mechanistic uh, explanation. Right, so, right. So. Okay. The other thing I was I was men mentioning Woodward simply because a sort of uh, very obvious question when we're dealing with these things is how do you know it's mechanical in the sense how do you know it's productive? And so in this respect I believe that in the debate in the last few years the mechanistic and the interventionist views have been sort of slowly approaching, okay, with the old neutral uh, manipulability account on the one hand, and recently Woodward suggested that maybe we could go that way as well. So I think distance has been shortened in a way. So your, your, your claim is that they should take functions more seriously into account? No. no. Okay. introduce a number of notions, as I was saying, as I was showing, sketches, schemata, uh, or possibly, or possibly, to sort of moderate that kind of that feeling you, you've got. Um, and I think they had to, simply because um, I think they very heavily rely on Salmon's mechanism, which was very strong, and they started off by saying, well, that was too strong, that worked just for chemistry and physics, if it eventually worked, so we need something which works also for the sort of special sciences. But then once you move to the special sciences, you have to relax it much more to account for complex systems. With regard to functions, that's one of the reasons why somebody is saying we should not think of pathology in terms of physiological mechanisms or neurobiological mechanisms, because those, what we call okay, physiological mechanisms or physiological components of the organism may be thought of in terms of functions, whereas you should not think of diseases as having a function. And that's the old other debating. Obviously, <laughs> along the line. Yeah. Okay. 